It's you. I thought someone more honest had written the letter, whom I would gladly have helped. What do you take me for? An imbecile like yourself? But, sir, I'm not guilty. Oh, you aren't. When I first met you, it was with a gang of outlaws. Now you're in prison, and I hear you've been branded. If you call that innocence... Well, you know I was the captive of the bandits, and that I also saved your life. In return, you knocked me unconscious, raped me, and then took my few remaining coins. Oh, it was you who brought about my downfall. And since that dreadful moment, I've not had a single happy hour. But... But I can forget it all and even ask your pardon for my harsh words. Oh, don't seal your heart against me. Save me. Not from death, which I do not fear, but... But from the dishonor of death is a criminal. Both heaven and my heart will reward you. Dear girl, you fascinate me. Your fate is in the hands of Monsieur de Cardeville. I have known him all my life, and I shall speak to him. If all goes well, you'll be taken to him tonight to be questioned in secret, and you will get a chance to prove how innocent you are. I feared the worst from this man but decided that if I had to prostitute myself that night, I would do so to stay alive. At nine o'clock, two men came for me and hustled me into a closed carriage that drove at once to a mansion that I believe belonged to Saint Florent. In total silence, I was led through one dark room after another and finally into a windowless chamber where Saint Florent was waiting along with a heavy-set man who struck me at once as being severe and cruel. The men who brought me there, when seen in the bright candlelight, were youthful and handsome. One was named La Rose, the other, Julian. Well, children, sit here by me. I shall call upon you alternately as the need arises. Therese, here is your judge who will decide your fate. But there is much to be explored first. She has 42 witnesses against her. It's been ages since we condemned anyone on better evidence than that. Evidence against me? Dealty or not! You'll die pissing if you don't instantly submit to everything which you'll demand of you. It is only by giving in to these infamies that the innocent can escape the wicked. It is the way of the world, my dear. The weak give in to the strong or give up the ghost. So begin by giving up your garments. <laughs> <laughs> my blouse was torn, my skirts pulled up over my head, and in no time I was naked as the day I was born. They drew up their chairs in a tight little circle around me, and I was passed from one to the other, stared at, fingered, and kissed for half an hour. Well, now, didn't I say she had a splendid ass? Ah, behind is divine. <laughs> I've never seen cheeks as fresh as these. Uh, with her past, how do you suppose she kept so fresh? She never gave herself willingly. Ah, I tell you, this girl's a rare one. She's never been had but by rape. Have you, my dear? Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. You've been had. You've been stretched too much for me. With my taste for virgins, I couldn't take this gaping hole. And as for your backside, I'd say it was the same story. You know what we do with girls like that. <laughs> and we will, too. And I hope you'll let me do it first. Fair enough. I'll watch you perform and pass the time playing the girl with Julian and LaRose while you use Therese as a man. I'm sick to death of women and don't enjoy them at all without a little excitement beforehand. Quickly I was made to mount upon a large chair, my arms upon its back, my knees on the arms, and my posterior prominently displayed. The two men stepped out of their breeches, tucked up their shirts, and paraded around naked from the waist down, bragging about the shape and texture of their behinds. Cardoville especially had firm, fine, dimpled white skin and enviable roundness. In front he seemed quite ordinary, but I was dismayed to note that Saint Florent possessed a monstrous weapon. Julian and La Rose, plainly excited by such exhibitions, also threw off their clothing and advanced spears in hand. Never have I seen anything like the fury with which the two older debauchees fell upon the youths, caressed them, took their members in their mouths, and handled with the vigor of mortal combat. Saint Florent crouched under me with my buttocks on a level with his face. Thoreau's drove his terrific member deeply into the socket offered by Cardoville. 
and Julien knelt before Saint Florent, exciting him with his tongue, and at the same time, bracing him against an attack by Cardoville, and while beating his friend Cardoville, enjoyed such pleasure that he ejaculated at once. Between the one he was using as a woman and the other who used him as a man, he cursed and gasped like a dying man. But Saint Florent restrained himself, and the tableau dissolved without his losing control. Ah, ah, you give me as much pleasure now as you did when you were fifteen, my boy. You think I'm a bit slow this evening? Well, this is the thirty-sixth time for me today. But let's not waste time for number thirty-seven. He fitted himself into Julien's mouth, his own mouth at my behind, and once more their interlocking ritual was performed with a change of partners. This time Saint Florent made his own offering successfully, and like his friend, shouted and swore, but with a more select and disgusting vocabulary of filth. Well, Teresh, now it's up to you. You can see that the candles are out, and they've got to be lighted again. Each of the libertines bent over me in turn, and I was obliged not only to take their exhausted organs in my mouth, but to suck, tease with my tongue, and nibble them while the two boys beat upon their backsides and repeatedly deposited their offering within those impure temples. Of the two organs I was manipulating, I felt Cardoville's revive first, and as a reward he slapped me upon the chest with all his strength. Saint Florent gave my ear a tug that nearly ripped it off. Then the orgy resumed. There were moments when all four bodies seemed to form a single beast with eight arms and legs. In between the bouts, I restored their weapons and directed them toward their various targets, while my own buttocks served as a kind of inspiration for some and as a playing field for others. Finally, I was given a rest after having been beaten black and blue, and they gave me a kind of ointment that miraculously healed my fresh scars in less time than it took to inflict them. Very well, La Rose. Take the little tramp now and start stitching. La Rose bent me backwards over a little stool, my arms and legs stretched wide apart and tied down. Then the monster calmly took a long needle, threaded it, and stitched up the entrance to my temple of love. Then he turned me over again and stitched up my backside in the same cold-blooded way. I cannot describe the agony. I very nearly fainted dead away. Splendid, La Rose. Now, unaccustomed as I am to anything except virgins, I can really enjoy a little whore like this. His erection was enormous and was increased by the spectacle of Julien making love to Cardoville before his eyes. I was turned face up for him to begin his attack and made delirious by the resistance he felt, forced himself against the straining threads. Some broke, others tore loose. The more I suffered, the more intense his pleasure. When I was ripped asunder, he plunged into me to the hilt, but withdrew at once without ejecting, and turned me on my face to repeat the ceremony. After deliberate exploration of the stitching, he forced himself with two violent assaults into the bleeding sanctuary. While I screamed in torment, he completed his excruciating ritual. My turn! My turn! <laughs> uh, no donning or mending for me now. So I'll put it to bed on a little cot to improve her circulation and uh, warm her up a bit. <laughs> they produced a large cross made of rough, spiky wood. But before strapping me onto it, a little silver ball the size of an egg was inserted into my behind. Immediately, it seemed to catch fire and burn inside me. I was strapped upon this cross of thorns, my back and thighs pressed upon the sharp prongs, and the terrible silver globe tore at my entrails, scalding and lacerating me from within. I screamed and twisted, but my torturer frolicked over me and seemed to suck the screams from my mouth. Before Cardoville's climax arrived, I was untied, and the burning ball retrieved and inserted in my vaginal canal, where it at once seared and scorched my womb. 
I was turned over on the cross whose thorns found even more sensitive flesh to tear, and Cardoville entered the forbidden passage while another did the same for him, until his ecstatic screams announced that his debauchery was at last completed. <sighs> I'm through with her now. You boys untie her and have your way with her. She's all yours now. One amused himself with the front of me, the other with the rear. They changed places again and again, and I was more deeply torn by their enormous organs than by the artificial barriers set up by Saint Florent. And while each one plunged himself into me simultaneously, they were in turn penetrated by the two older villains, I was the mainspring, the crossroads of these orgies. Four times each of them had me, and when at last they tired, I was ready to faint. But once more, their miraculous ointment removed all visible traces of the atrocities. With such medical skill, it's very hard for ladies who feel themselves uh, abused to make complaints against us. Who would believe them? Oh, this charming girl can't complain. On the eve of her destruction, all she can do is pray. She won't do either one if she's smart. <laughs> no one would take her word against our own, and her death would only be made more cruel. <laughs> Surely this girl must realize that we have amused ourselves with her by the natural, uncomplicated right that the strong have to abuse the weak. <laughs> uh, Therese? <laughs> It's still night time. <laughs> Get dressed and the lads will take you back to jail. Before I could say a word, I was bundled into a carriage by La Rose and Julian, who continued to abuse and penetrate me during the ride, in spite of the dreadful internal pains I still suffered. I took comfort in the sole hope that remains to one caught up in a life as luckless as mine, the thought of leaving it soon. Two days later, as I languished in my cell, Cardoville appeared in all his judicial finery and accused me of more crimes than I could answer. Well, that's the case against you, Therese. <laughs> Tell me, do you know a gentleman who lives in Lyon, a Monsieur de saint Florent? Yes, sir, you know... Excellent, excellent. He has testified that he first met you in the company of thieves, that you stole from him and betrayed him to your evil friends, and that during a visit to his home some years later, you stole a watch from him worth 100 oh, louis. Sir, ah. sir, ah, I interpret uh, your grief as an admission of guilt. Oh, villain! God will punish you! God will strike you down. You are no judge but a monster. Take her away, Jayla. <laughs> the girl is obviously deranged, and so the case against her is complete. A trial will begin at once, and afterwards she will be taken to Paris and hanged. Under what dark star was I born? that my every generous thought at once overwhelmed me with misfortune. Why has Providence, whom I worship, punished me for virtue and surrounded me with villains who reach the pinnacle of happiness and success? Those few who treated me well are dead. Dubois, Saint Florent, Bressac, Rodin, Jeannon, Roland, and now Cordoville, all unspeakable ingrates are rich and free, while I go to die the death of a common criminal. <laughs> then is there any wonder that I embrace it gladly? I have walked in company with reptiles, trod upon thorns, been denied parents, kin, friends, fortune and assistance. I have drunk tears, and eaten only misery. Even now my guards call me to hurry on toward doom. And you who listen to my cavalcade of horrors understand that I yearn only for death and to embrace the God whom I know to be too just not to receive me in innocence and love.
let the author complete this tale of misery. You will perhaps recall that the listeners to this recital were Madame de Lorsange and her protector, Monsieur de Courville. And you will not be surprised to learn that once Therese revealed her true name to be Justine, the two ladies recognized each other as long-lost sisters and shared a lengthy and tearful embrace. Courville was able to release her from the clutches of the law in his own custody and to have her installed in his own luxurious chateau. She was cared for in every way. Even her insidious brand was removed by expert surgery. Color returned to her cheeks and laughter to her lips. Her case came to the attention of the king, who proclaimed her innocence in public and restored her good name. Saint Florent and Cardoville could not be punished, unfortunately, because one had just been appointed governor of a province of France and the other made secretary of colonial trade. Then, suddenly, Therese, or rather Justine, became uneasy and troubled and began to weep unpredictably. I was not born for happiness, she told her sister. I cannot believe it will endure, and nothing they could say calmed her. Then one night, a fierce thunderstorm raged about the chateau. Our Justine rushed to close the windows, hesitated an instant, when suddenly a bolt of lightning blazing as if from a divine hand struck her full upon the breast. In an instant she was reduced to a hideous, lifeless ruin. Madame de Lorsange, her sister, fled to a convent in a fit of remorse for her own many sins, and Corville devoted his life and fortune to good works, and was much blessed throughout the kingdom. And all of you who have wept tears of sympathy for poor Justine, in spite of our perhaps exaggerated treatment of her woes, may extract this moral. Think on her lesson, and know that true happiness is found nowhere but in the arms of virtue. And if God, in his infinite wisdom, permits virtue to be persecuted on earth, it is only to compensate it by heaven's most seductive reward.